saying like, well, this kind of activism is more relevant than this kind of activism. Instead of saying, really, we need to like be in every nook and cranny. I mean, you can't not be in institutions if you want institutions to change. But there are clearly people who are outside institutions who think, what a waste of time. I never stepped foot in those four walls. So sort of valuing the numerous places where we can make change, thinking about leverage points, but through a whole variety of lenses. Because mm -hmm. doing it in any one place and then not valuing other people's work and building coalitions, because some people think policy is a waste of time. Because yeah. that's within structures that are old school and, you know, mm -hmm. so anyway. Right, so exactly. Thought. And you know what the mark of a healthy movement is? Which is really hard to achieve, and this gets back at the institutional question that you were talking about. The most effective way to dismantle the power structure within institutions, and not just universities or campuses, or but you know the medical industrial complex, whatever institution, societal institution we're talking about, is the more folks are working on multiple levels together with a concerted strategy. There are no there are no bad places to be working, meaning that inside institutions, being an agitator outside, the more you organize a coalition of people from multiple movements, insiders and outsiders, folks working in different aspects of the institution, the more pressure points you so it is a tactical strategy, but it is built on complex bodies. It's not just about folks coming together tactically, although that's part of it. It's about how you create a container so that everybody brings their full self, their complex self to that container. Because you're not just asking people to bring their minds to the table, you're asking them to bring all the intersections in their bodies why? Because that is that is that is where the information comes from. If you don't have people who have experienced those conditions at the table, speaking from within their bodies about the conditions that exist within those institutions that they're facing, that's that is where we say it here. Those conditions are what nourish the vision and values to help develop and build strategies. So it comes from right inside the body. We don't have to make it up. Yeah. You, you know, you have this vision all of a sudden from the movie Avatar. Mm -hmm. yeah, remember when they all went to war? Yeah. Everyone came. Everyone came. Yeah. And yeah. It was just but often what we do is we create containers and little boxes and say, like you were saying, only this group of people can do this, or these outsiders, or these insiders. This takes a very carefully constructed, thoughtful container that is based on complex bodies. And then the wisdom, see this is, this is about organizing, the wisdom comes from the experiences of people who are at the table if the container is big enough to house everybody who is wanting to strategize with us. So does this get at your question a little bit about how we and it and it's and it's it none of it happens as you know overnight. It is it is a long term, lifelong process. But the more sophisticated the container in terms of holding complex bodies, the more the wisdom gets generated and the more dismantling that can be done. Do you see this anywhere? Do I see it yeah. anywhere? Right. Oh yeah. I mean can you tell us where you said them? Oh, yeah, like where around the country yeah. I see it. Yeah, I see it actually. There's this really interesting a couple of places where it's happening. There, it's called the Roots Coalition, and it is a cross movement group of folks who um, are funded by the Estrella Foundation, which is a social justice foundation based in New York. And they convene a group of grantees. Um, across movements, mostly people of color led organizations, reproductive justice, LGBT, environmental justice, etc. And they are actually having, they're doing really amazing strategy work right now, and they're looking at how to build a campaign that's based on these principles around an issue 
So they're actually trying to think about an issue-based campaign, whether it's around immigration or the Real ID Act, which is a big issue in many communities, not just the LGBT community. Um, and they're trying to apply these principles to a campaign. They haven't decided what it's going to be yet, but um, it's a very exciting hotspot across movements. I also see this actually in every movement, including the environmental justice movement. There's a whole conservation movement, basically, that is much more mainstream. But a lot of the smaller reproductive, I mean, the smaller environmental justice groups headed by people of color or multiracial groups of folks are organizing around things like Katrina or the Gulf Coast. They're really on the ground doing uh, the oil spill, all of that. They, they're really on the ground doing that kind of cross coalition building. So it's happening, but you know where it's happening, not on the national level. Because the national groups, all of them, are stuck more in a rights frame, and they're, which is important, but they're very divorced from the folks that are working on the ground in these coalitions that are cross-cutting, actually. So there's a whole body of work out there that doesn't get visibilized, because what you see is, for example, in the LGBT movement, the mainstream agenda, don't ask, don't tell, hate crimes, and the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And you think that's the only thing the LGBT movement is working, mainstream, legally, is, is working on. But there's so much more. So the question is who controls the agenda, right? And who gets to set it? You know, so for many of us, we see Katrina and the oil spill as an LGBT issue. Many of our mainstream LGBT organizations at the national level would fundamentally disagree and say that there's nothing related to the oil spill that has anything to do with the LGBT. Although LGBT workers are dying and getting sick from the oil spill, people are losing their job, LGBT people are losing their jobs. So we have this challenge, you know? So I don't know if these are concrete examples yes, for you. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts and questions about the values piece and the strategy piece here? Any reflections? Yes, Colette. So Lisa's my good friend. So I'll play devil's advocate with you on that one. Yeah. Okay, so you and I go back Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to disagree with you on that strategy. And so the position that I will hold is we have to go for Don't Ask, Don't Tell and end up. Yeah, we do. And the reason is high visibility, change the culture, Agreed. move it forward. If we're down in the Gulf doing the Gulf spill with other groups, that's valuable work. And I love you too. <laughs> oh, I love you too. And I think this is great. I think it's a both and. And I think it's back to this conversation earlier. Mm -hmm. What I think there, every, every group in the, for example, the LGBT movement has a role to play. What we don't do is value. The national groups may be working on um, don't ask, don't tell, the high visibility impact stuff. But they often don't value the groups at the grassroots level that also support this work and are doing other kinds of work that they also see as LGBT work at the same time. So it's, it's what gets valued and the fact that value often comes from the grassroots. They value what the nationals do, but it doesn't go the other way. So if they were valuing you in ways that were meaningful to you as that smaller group, they yes. would be bringing you along, creating visibility for you, sharing funds, supporting your work in your own ways. Yes, and that actually, actually it's about understanding that the movement needs to be strategic about all of them. There's places for everybody to do the work. And so we need everybody at every level, whether it's legal and, and policy, to grassroots, LGBT-focused in a more narrowly defined way, and LGBT-focused in much broader ways. The Gulf spill, environmental justice, all of these issues, all of the ways in which we do the work need to be valued. But the power dynamic doesn't work that way. And that's, that's, the, that's the gay ink or the, 
the, you know, the choice ink or the conservation ink, we have this problem across movements and it makes and creates a huge difference. So I think we're talking about a both and not an either one. Other thoughts or questions about this? And so what I want to get to is how, how does this land on you around values and strategy in relationship to what goes on here at Grand Valley City? And how are you taking this in and how is it useful to the work that you are doing or want to do? For me, it's hard to picture myself being a pressure point within an organization. For example, I'm going into medicine, and that's a field where LGBT is not okay to work in medicine. You're being very personal with people. And so, like we were talking in our group, sometimes there are areas, like in West Michigan, it's so challenging to be an advocate for that and kind of a peer pressure for the rights within the organization when there are already kind of bubbles within the state that I could move to and be safe and kind of yes. hide from that. So it's difficult for me to be like, okay, I can I can get my master's and run a lab or run a hospital and influence this change, but I could also get my master's, they find out that I'm a gay man and fire me. And like right. a decade's worth of work for me is done. That's right. And that's real. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you all wrap your mind around the the reality of the challenges and opportunities of doing doing this work when the costs can be as high as what you just described. Any thoughts on that? Are folks just stumped? <laughs> no, no. Or just contemplating it. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. Connie. Um, I'll come right to you. you know, the way that I see things at the university here is, you know, we have limited resources. And at the end of the day, decision has to be made on how to allocate this, these limited resources. So in a way, you know, different units and departments competing for the same resource. And even if we are working for the same university, we have in values or maybe the misalignment in values. Uh -huh. okay. yes. So in order for us to move in the same direction, we have to align these values. So that my values are not competing or clashing with your values or the yes. university's values. That at the end of the day, the resource and the you know um, services can be located to what I'm trying to do with my values mm -hmm. or the values that I'm to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So I think in my mind it has to do with how can we align all of these values so that we are moving in the same direction mm -hmm. and get the buy-in from you know the higher ups. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So does that also mean similar to an exercise that we just did here is having conversations, open conversations about well what are our shared values? I mean do you think that those are I mean, where would you start? I would probably start with building coalitions. Mm -hmm. You know, having people come to the table. Um, same exercise that we're doing here. You yeah. know, what are your values? Exactly. And then coming up with some maybe some group agreements about those values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts and notes? I know you were. Thank you for that. No. Uh,
seems like just in terms of strategy that we really have to be aware of our own messiness and our, our limitations and strengths and all of that. That's sort of right. Thing. As we build toward being more heady or mm -hmm. ultimate kinds of things. We That's need right. to be kept together. about values. What people do is they often go right to creating the coalition and then figuring out what box they're going to put each person in. So you're going to do this in the coalition and you're going to take notes and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. But what we don't do is have the harder conversation and the glue conversation about values and then agree upon what values are going to guide the work. You go to values first and architecture second. And what we often do is we just start trying to slot people into roles and get down to the tasks. Now the tasks are important, but what ends up happening is we begin to start marginalizing bodies in coalition work and pushing people who want to have a conversation about values or need to because their survival depends on it. Right? Often, the more privilege you experience in your body, the less conversation you need to have about values because the dominant culture represents your values. So it's creating the space to have those conversations and to do that work because then it gets embedded in the architecture of the coalition. And that's often the place, that's often the, what doesn't happen. I saw some hands here and back there. Bye. Oh, no, no, no problem. We're going to be wrapping up in a minute. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. When I think about creating the space to have the conversations around values, I don't think necessarily of having a lot of meetings like this that everybody will attend because everybody won't. That's right. I think that there are places that we already can uh, see as potential containers for these uh, uh, values conversations, and it's mostly in the I mean, I have it easy because I teach in humanities, so we discuss these things in my classrooms all the time. And that's mm -hmm. one place where I think this is this is my contribution. We're gonna we're gonna discuss values with these students, so I see the hopefulness of, of future generations. But but when we're thinking about today and what do each of us do with our our lived existence, I keep thinking standing out in the hallway would have these opportunities. The the real the grassroots nature of it means it's gonna happen outside of the it's like taking the table. We, we said, you know, bring these discussions to the table. I think we have to take the table to wherever we are. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I do this. Because what I am doing is what you can do. I actually am taking this framework, not just myself, but all of us that have been part of this for the last five years. And we are doing what's called worldview dissemination mm -hmm. in small groups like this around the country. And we are not saying this is the be all and end all. What we're saying is we are wanting to have a conversation with you about a lens and a framework and a worldview and values that we hope not only will generate conversation for us in the moment, but that you can use and then bring to your community and begin generating similar conversations in your community and similar pieces of work. And so, Part of this is how do you disseminate the framework, and there needs to be a strategy around doing that. I do believe that the more you get thinking like this out, the more energy you build and the more worldview you build in a community, it begins to shift the culture and more and more people will want to sign on to doing this work and move beyond worldview into the architectural work and doing coalition work differently. So you all should be thinking about what you, how you may want to take this out in your classroom and in your home. Yeah. I think though the difficulty. I'm going to be difficult. Okay. The difficulty I love you too. <laughs> We're good. We're good. We're there. That feels very hopeful to me. Yes, let's take the table wherever we are. Let's do it in the hallway. Let's. But I think the.
dangerous or is romanticizing that idea of, of we'll just take the table wherever we are is that if you're not taking that table to a place that has institutional power, if I'm not taking this conversation to a place that has institutional power, I'm just some crazy lady shouting in the hallway about complex bodies. That doesn't necessarily create, it's not necessarily a road to institutional change. I think it's good. I like it, but I think there's a danger in sort of romanticizing yes. that approach as opposed to a sort of, you know, I mean, you can come back to the rec center and shout about complex bodies, but if nobody is going to hear that in a way right. that has any recognition, it doesn't create any change at any level. That's you know? right. I, mean, I think it's, it goes back in some ways to that question of yes. how do you get it to the level that has institutional power. Yeah. I think it's dangerous to ignore that. I, I agree with you. And I think that's a brilliant point. And the reason you do conversations like this in the hallway and in groups is you find other people who are interested in having a conversation, and then you strategize. You don't, I agree, you would not go back to the rec, rec center and say, oh, this is so hot, we're gonna just start doing complex bodies everywhere. I mean, you know, you were gonna, you know, it's just not gonna work. But now, you have now, all of you have been in a room with people, many of whom across the campus, whom you now know are interested in this conversation, and have some of the worldview development. That can become a strategy group. So you share now a language that, that you then can use to strategize about how you would have this conversation across the campus. Um, but you have to start small, and you have to start strategic. But things like this surface who's interested and who's who's wanting to have the conversation. Do you see what I'm saying? You have to start you have to start bringing people out first in order to figure out how you connect. So that there's there's a community organizing strategy to why you begin to host these conversations. Does that make sense? Right. But you can't just trot it and roll it out. I agree with you. Other thoughts and questions about this? Yes, I, I have a, a, a question really about that, and that the idea for me is that what are institutions? Aren't they groups of people <laughs> who form together, who come together and, and gain power somehow? And so what are we? You know what I mean? So, so I, I think you're absolutely right too, and I don't think it's just romantic to think that this is how the work gets done. I don't see it as us against institutions. I see it as us becoming a new kind of institution. Yeah. That, that kind of transformation yes. happens from the inside, mm -hmm. not when we draw a battle line between us and them. The inclusivity that I heard at the very beginning. The interdependence. The inter yeah. interdependence and inclusivity, we're all part mm -hmm. of it. Well, and I think this is, this is, you know, this is the question, is as, as members of this institution, people who have different roles within it, and there are different levels of power within it, this is the question for you all to grapple with as you move along with this. What is the strategy? What is the inside, the outside? How do you agitate on all of these different levels? What's, what's the conversation? And so I encourage you to continue um, to talk with each other about this in this group and others that you know across the campus that are interested in moving this kind of thinking forward. Because the more we find each other, there are power in numbers. And institutions can change as you identify more and more people who want to think like this, who are thinking like this, who are, or who are just open sponges, who are just really interested in this kind of stuff. And that's how you're going to change over time. So we are coming to the end of our time. Um, I want to give folks an opportunity to just say some closing comments about today, any closing reflections, what worked or didn't for you, and then I want to uh, send you off on your day. Yes, Colette. I'd just like to expand on what you just said about finding other 
finding people in our institution or in our community who are like you, who are sponges, who are ready to go, ready to learn more and take it to the next level. We interested in those people for our social justice training. That's exactly what we're looking for. So many people do really have the passion, the sense of justice, injustice, and, and feel powerless. And so we want to create a situation where people can um, hit the ground and create the kind of change that they want to. Yes, absolutely. And who can they talk to if they have lists of people that they would like to recommend? But I do want to hear what your how your experience was throughout the day. Not everybody has to speak, but if there's one, if there's folks that want to offer something, was this useful? <laughs> yes, no. Uh, I'm impressed by the size of this. It's a there's something like a paradigm shift or a, a worldview change or something. was a joy and an honor. I want to thank Colette for inviting me and Milt and Carrie and I look forward to our continued work together and I look forward to working with all of you over the next year as I'm back. Uh, I'll be back here quite a bit with lots of friends over the next year. So, um, so and I'm going to be sticking around. I'll be here over the next couple of days so if you have questions or things that you want to percolate about or talk about I'll be mostly located at the LGBT Center, and feel free to come by. Uh, we'll be sending an evaluation out over email, and we would love to yes. hear from you. And also, if you would like to meet with Lisa one of the times that she's here, or if you have somebody who is interested in social justice training, or a member of a community organization that we need to connect with to be sure to involve community members, um, please let us know. We'll make that happen. I, I super, super, super ask you to please that they are just the ones we want to have in this training because they're our number one priority. So student leaders, um, please let us know. Yeah. And thanks so much, everybody. Have a good day. Oh, and thank keep, you. Let's keep talking about complex bodies, okay? <laughs>